lovely friends, it's Margaret, and it is time for another Fresh Reads Friday. Welcome or welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be doing something in a little series that I like to call Fresh Reads Friday. If you are new to the channel, basically it's just the occasional review series where I take a book that I have read recently and I think that you will like too and I tell you a little bit about it. Today I am going to be reviewing the first two books in the Gargoyle Queen trilogy. I was kindly sent both of these books in anticipation of Tear Down the Throne's release in May. So we have Capture the Crown and Tear Down the Throne, books one and two. There's a third book that will be coming out at some point. I'm sure the name of the book is in the back of this one. What is the name of the new? Conquer the Kingdom. Conquer the Kingdom is coming out next year. Am I bitter about that? Just, just a little bit. You want to send me that one for review too? Just um, let me know. This is set in the same world as her previous series, the Crown of Shards series, and we are following actually in Capture the Crown. We are following Gemma Ripley, who is a side character in that series. I'm Going to summarize primarily the plot of this one because I don't I don't want to give away stuff. So we start this out with Gemma. She is a princess. She is also a spy. She has created this very vain image where people think she's only interested in clothes and parties and all of that stuff. However, that is just kind of a facade. She is currently undercover in a mine where her country they they mine tear stone. It is an important metal in this kind of the economy of these countries, and some of it has been going missing, and she thinks that it might have something to do with their mortal enemies, the Morricones. She ends up going undercover and finding out not only is Morta their kind of like this kingdom that they do not like, that they have been at odds with for as long as Gemma can remember and before, uh, she ends up finding out that they, they may be behind this, they are involved, and she also ends up running into Leonidas. He is the queen's bastard son and he still has royal status and all that stuff but uh, there's a lot that's gone on with him and they do have some history because there was they did run into each other as children. They're meeting again as adults when Gemma saves her life and gets involved in a whole bunch of other stuff that happens. So overall thoughts, I enjoyed these books. I ended up giving them four stars. If you're looking for a, like a fantasy romance series with the emphasis on the romance, this is a good one to kind of go for. If you're a fan of like The Cruel Prince, books like that, this is kind of in that same vein except they are adults and also not nearly as mean to each other. Like there's a lot of high life or death stakes but they do have a little bit more maturity than certain people in the Cruel Prince series. As I mentioned in the beginning I um definitely like we did leave off in book two in a better place or a more satisfying place for me as a person. Uh, so the story behind me finishing book one is basically I read book one on an airplane and I don't know. I had other books that I needed to read, so I put left book two in my suitcase, which I checked. <laughs> and so a girl finishes book one and is like, well, crap. There were some, some regrets in the choices that I made in, in which books I prioritized in my packing. I think it's a really decent, well written fantasy story. I think the author set out to do what she meant to do, and I mean, there weren't any like low points for, in the books for me, except for like. The normal low points that I have because I have terrible secondhand embarrassment and can't handle it in, in books when people are about to do really stupid stuff and I know it's gonna happen. Just can't. And there's so much stupid stuff that people do in these books. So let's talk characters. I will admit these characters are just like a little over the top at times. Specifically Gemma. Gemma is just so intense about everything and there are reasons why Gemma is the way she is. She carries a lot of trauma because of things that happened in the other series and you do like get a pretty good idea of that and you don't I don't feel like you need to have read the other series to understand what happens in this series but there is stuff that happened to Gemma in the past that just she has no off switch like she knows how to have fun and then do all that stuff we especially see that in the second book but she just is very black and white in a lot of what she does. To some extent it does serve her character really well with where she is and what she's trying to accomplish and how single-minded it makes her in trying to ferret out what is going on with this tear stone, why are the Morricones messing things up, what's going on, like it really makes her single-minded and I think that there are things that would have happened if she had not had that single-minded focus on these people are awful I want to murder all of them. However a girl needs to learn a little bit of nuance here. She does. She she is it, it is a part of her character arc. She just needs to learn a little bit of chill and I do think that is something that she ends up 
learning as she gets to know and starts to work more closely with Leonidas because they keep ending up being thrown together because they both despite her just being like I want I want to murder your entire family they also keep being thrown together because they have um similar goals in both of these books which I can't tell you because it is slightly spoilery but they do have a common enemy we'll say we'll say that I really do like how she does end up learning not just through Leonidas but through some of the other people that she meets while she's working with him she does end up learning that people are more complicated than she feels like than she feels that they are because of how these people have affected her not to say that some of them don't deserve to like die a fiery death hopefully there's still hope that that might happen in in book three I don't usually make a case for murdering people as children but a lot wouldn't have happened in this series if someone had been. I really do like the dynamic between Leonidas and Gemma. There, it, like, you can definitely see that he is coming from a different place than she is. He is definitely coming from a far less, at least in, in relation to her and her country and her people, far less traumatized a place. He also has a lot of trauma. But a different type of trauma. I will say there are places where I did feel a little bit, especially in the way that, like, the characters or especially how Gemma reacted um it felt a little bit like I'm reading a YA novel versus an adult novel um so just keep that in mind if you do not like the YA vibe maybe don't pick this one up it could almost be a crossover type of series some other things that I did like about the characters I really do like the relationship that we get to see between Gemma and her dad and the rest of her family um I like the fact that we don't do the evil stepmother trope here that she has a pretty cool awesome stepmother that we get to interact with especially in the second book there are a couple of side characters that are real fun I'm not I'm not sure how I feel about the representation of one of them because she is definitely modeled after a Japanese-esque culture it is not the central culture but it, it is kind of showing that the, the wider world is not just white people there's just some stuff that feels slightly stereotypy and even though we have a really interesting kind of well-rounded side character in regards to this it's also one of those things that's like i feel like we could have delved a little deeper into some of that i also kind of like this is one where you have magical creatures like Gemma has a gargoyle partner and leonidas has a giant bird it's like Pokemon. I like the relationship that we get to, that, they, that we see, the partnership that we see between the people and their kind of animal companions that they have and the fact that it's very much a partnership and like both parties still have their own lives that they lead. Like it's not as kind of a situation where you've got like a horse and you stick him in the stall and he stays there when you don't need him. Like both Grimly and Lyra have their own lives and while they are very attached to their humans, their humans are not all that they are. That was a really interesting little touch on how those relationships work. The villains for the most part are okay. A couple of them are very complicated and then we have one that he's a little bit caricature-y. He's a little bit just it, again intense. There's not a lot of subtlety in these characters or in this writing like just not a lot. When it comes to one of the main what's kind of like the series bad guy they don't have a lot of uh nuance to their character and that was one of the things that like one of my my few comments was like just knowing as much as i know about how royal families in actual history have operated and knowing how the kinds of politics that we're dealing would have actually played out when you have multiple countries that are trying to like undermine each other but also trying not to get on the bad side of everyone else then again you also had some really dumb dudes that were in charge of countries. I truly, you did. And this, this, this person is set up to be one of those really dumb people in charge of countries. Anyways, I thought it was interesting to have that particular person juxtaposed against a couple of the other kind of antagonists that we see in the series. I would have liked a little more nuance to this character instead of just kind of going straight for the serial killer vibe. Didn't really need to happen though because the main focus like basically the bad guys, the antagonists are there to, to put friction between this relationship because again, it is a fantasy emphasis on the romance. As, as far as the plot goes, I enjoyed it. I think that it is a very readable book. This is something that you're going to sit down and you're going to be, 
outside of obvious issues with secondhand embarrassment. If you are a normal person and not someone who has to like close the book when you start to realize and like, prepare yourself for people getting into major trouble, I think this is going to be one that you like you can sit down and you can read in an afternoon. I read the majority of Capture the Crown on a flight, reading reading on the flight, like I read the first half, it's very easy to read. There is a mystery element to both of the plots in this, there is a lot of intrigue and politics and all of that stuff, so if you like those in plots, go ahead, like pick this up. It's also very good if you like slow burn. If you're one of those people that's like, you know, I'd rather they don't kiss in book one. That said, I did find pieces of their relationship rushed in the second book. Like the first book it was fine, you could feel the tension, you could feel the conflict. I just think that going from where we've been for the majority of the two books to where we end up at the end of the book, I would have liked, I would have liked it to feel a little bit less like it was just a complete flip from like, it's one of those things where like partly you know someone is making a big fuss because you're trying to obviously prove that you are not as into this person as you are, but still the way that it was handled, it did kind of feel like a 180. It's one of those things that like, in hindsight, we could have smoothed this out a little bit. It did make me question a few things, like going, just how quickly we went from from one extreme to the other, and I was like, I wanted a, a little, a little more easing into that. However, I did like kind of the difference between the two plots, how we are doing different, pulling on different tensions in both of them, and I liked like both of how they went through. I thought that for the most part they were well paced, again with the exception of that kind of romantic angle. I am running out of space so we're gonna go through world building real quick, which is not, there's not a lot to say about the world building. Like I said at the beginning, she knows her stuff, she knows her world, she's, you can tell she's got a lot of this built behind, but everything that's in the world is actually just meant to, to be there as set dressing. It is not something that you're going to sit down and you're going to read because you want all of the lore and all of that. There are politics involved, there's world building involved, but they are all in serving that main romance. Um, you could very much have put this in a historical context, you very much could have had something similar, like, I mean, like, the conflicts that are happening would not have happened in, in real life. But like, you, like, it's something that you could have, you could have pulled out of a contemporary novel and just put in a different set dressing. And that is what fantasy romance is for, is to have a romance in a fantastical setting where you could have death matches and mortal enemies and all of that stuff that does not work in the real world. So aside from the few things that were like, stop beating the horse, we, it's, it's dead, it is, it is dead dead. Aside from those few things, I did think that she had an interesting, compelling world. I like the political systems that she built up and the kind of ways that we learn things. There was a lot of info dump in the first book because she's trying to catch you up to a little bit of what's happened in book the, not book one, but like the first series. But again, you don't need that first series. And I think for the most part, while it, it's net, it's one of those things that's like a necessary evil and she did it as well as she could do. The only thing that I don't really like is there were a whole bunch of like just random flashbacks that happen. And I didn't feel like they added anything to the story. I felt like those could have just been summaries of her experience um, or they could have been worked into the novel a little bit differently because it's one of those things like, and this is a personal taste preference, but it's one of those things where like you'd have a, a break, a paragraph break, and it would be all in italics, and we go through this whole scene, and I'm just like, this is taking away from the story that you are telling, and what is going on, and now I'm frustrated, and this is a very odd place to have a flashback. Like, she does have an in-world explanation for it, and why we're doing this, and I'm hoping that we're going to build on it in the third book, and it's going to, we're going to see it used more in the way we see it used at the end of the second book, but it was one of those things I was like, I would have preferred less of this and more summary. That is what I thought of Capture the Crown and Tear Down the Throne. Like I said, Tear Down the Throne just came out in May, so if you are interested in these, go ahead and check them out. If you are feeling chatty, let me know, do you read fantasy romance? And if you do, what is your favorite fantasy romance that you have read? If you are not feeling chatty, but you still want to let me know that you watched to the end of the video, go ahead and leave a crown emoji. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, if you enjoyed this video, I will have some other stuff over here that you can check out on my channel. I will have more Fresh Reads Fridays up here and then whatever is newest on my channel down here. That is it for now, my friends. Happy reading and I will see you later when we will talk about more wordy, nerdy things. Bye!